So I'm Lorna Murray. I'm one of now four consultant physicians. Through in the other room, we have Dr. Kirk Nolan, who I'll try and introduce before the end of the day. He's just arrived in the country from Texas and is on an international medical graduate fellowship. So he's going to be with us for a year, which is fantastic news because we are operating at a consultant capacity of 50%, which you probably all know we've lost Simon Evans to retirement. And we had David Ross for a year before, unfortunately he had to go back for family reasons. So to have Kirk with us is going to be fantastic. He's going to bring lots of different views to respiratory medicine. So I'll introduce you so that if you're picking up a phone to us or emailing in, you'll know Kirk as well. So the other, my other consultant colleagues are Dr. Stephen Thomas, whose main subspecialty interest is lung cancer. And I hope that a few of you have met Stephen over the years. He's our now our most senior consultant. And Dr. Ed Patterson, whose main subspecialty interest is cystic fibrosis. But we all do, obviously, general respiratory. And then I should also remem remember poor Professor Mike Pokey, who is now your local consultant. So I'll introduce Mike a wee bit more. My background is that I came up now almost 10 years ago, having trained in Glasgow. And I don't know what my subspecialty interest was, but it's changed over those 10 years. So I'm now running the severe asthma side of things with Corrine Clark in Ragmore. And two years ago, I got involved in trying to do a business case. We, this, the sleep service was not even supported financially. So for the last two years, we, in a time of austerity, have been trying to get a supported sleep service. So this is where I feed in. So that is the NHS Highland Sleep Team now. We have Mike leading it for us because he works at the Brompton with his main interest being neuromuscular disorders and sleep. I've come in, I did some training in intensive care in St Thomas's and over in Vancouver. So I've got a bit of a background. Wendy, like um, Phyllis, is the person who makes everybody better. And she has been now in the service about 15 years. So the service goes back to 1990 when it was set up by one of the senior ward sisters on Ward 11. When Kath retired, Wendy took over. Wendy now has, just as of the beginning of this year, Myred McLeod, she was a band five. She's now a band six specialist nurse. We have a vacancy in the band five, which we hope to fill. Yvonne, or Vonny as some of you may know her, is the person who really sets up all the masks, does all the ventilator side of things. And then the service would be nowhere if we didn't have Caroline Nicholl in the background, making sure everything happens. So if you're ever phoning in, it'll be Caroline you probably speak to, but the rest, that's the team behind the NHS Highland Sleep Team. Quick bit of history, non-invasive ventilation goes back to 1928 when the first iron lung was tested in Boston. The Emerson iron lung was used mainly during the polio epidemics, so it's negative pressure ventilation. So it was sucking the lungs out. Now non-invasive ventilation is positive pressure delivered through delivering a positive pressure into the lungs. It was interesting to see when I was just looking through to do the talk that $1,500 was the cost of that treatment at that time, which was the same price as an average home. So all those people with polio that have survived the epidemic would not be alive had we not spent money on their health care then. That's a baby's iron lung. And that's the iron lung that sort of came 1950s, 1960s. And I was in St Thomas's in 1999 and there was still one patient who could not convert over to positive pressure ventilation. So I have seen the iron lung in action. And this bit here is where all their physio gets done. So they literally open that glass top and do the physio. It's very interesting getting intravenous fluids because it's only delivered when there's not the, when the negative pressure is sucking in. Is that the right way around? But anyway, the, the fluids do not run for the whole time when you're in the iron lung. I was hearing from St Thomas's that the patient has now died and they do not have any iron lungs in the Lane Fox unit. Oops, sorry. So I apologise because I had to pilfer slides. I've never done a talk on non-invasive ventilation. So 
I think um, Phyllis again mentioned John Stradling. He is the guru of sleep medicine. He works in Oxford. He's probably nearly going to retire and he has done loads of work on education. So these are his slides. The website is the ARTP. That's our association of respiratory and technical physiologists, I think. So there's lots of resource on there if you're ever needing resource. And I've pilfered his slides. So he describes as non-invasive ventilation that it's just simply artificial ventilation. It can be full or partial and it's delivering it without intubating the patient or performing a tracheostomy. So it's usually delivered, as you saw from Phyllis's slides, by either a nasal or full face mask. And the late 1990s, that was the ventilator I worked with. That's a nippy. And now you saw what Phyllis's ventilators are. What did you say? The size of the palm of a hand is the latest one. And they've got a lot quieter. That nippy was very, very noisy when it delivered positive pressure. Sorry, I'm in your way. Um, so technology has been brilliant for this area. So the aims are that you're going to support ventilation and improve the patient's ventilatory function. Another of the aims is that if their carbon dioxide is high, then we need to be lowering it with ventilation. And most importantly, and that's why I do love this area, we improve the symptoms and we can increase the lifespan of patients. The reason that this has become a nightmare for all of us is because everybody uses different terms. So we don't even speak the same language. I can't even speak to the anaesthetists in Moore and speak the same language about ventilation because we all use different terminology. So you heard Phyllis mentioned CPAP. So CPAP is not a form of ventilation because it's delivering a continuous positive airway pressure. To deliver ventilation, you have to have a difference between your inspiratory pressure and your expiratory pressure. And then you see it called BiPAP. I've already used NIPI. That's the um, name of the equipment. So that's the trade name. So we'll talk about BiPAP, NIPI, and then John Stradling's mentioned that if anybody wants to look at it further, that bottom website, I think we're going to send these out to you because I was very late in doing the presentation. Um, he says that is not for the faint hearted. I didn't even open up that link. No, thank you. So uses of NIV, most of the non-invasive ventilation during the day when we're awake, we can usually ventilate well enough. But when we go to sleep at night, it's only the diaphragm that works when all our muscles are relaxed. So all of us slightly under ventilate overnight compared to during the day. When you've got problems with your lungs, that's when you're going to run into problems with your ventilation. So most patients, it's, it start, certainly starts overnight. Sometimes you have to then go up to all day. So people who you may know with motor neuron disease become ventilated for 24 hours, but they start with overnight ventilation. It can be temporary support. So we've got this thing which you may see on some of our letters, overlap syndrome. So they've got Phyllis's condition of, over, of obstructive sleep apnea, but with COPD. And when you put those two together, they can, that can result in a high level of CO2. So sometimes they start off in non-invasive ventilation and some go back to CPAP, but in my experience, it's not that many. Although Mike might be about to change that for us with his knowledge. And then you'll all know that now Doxapram, how many people remember Doxapram? I'm showing, yeah, it's, this depends on age. <laughs> so I'm with you. <laughs> So doxapram was a horrible drug that we gave to patients with COPD and respiratory failure to keep them alive in the 90s. It was horrible, wasn't it? <laughs> 90s, still in use in the 90s. Um, so we now have converted over, thankfully, to non-invasive ventilation. So people who you might see in the practice or who you're supporting out in the community um, as I said, polio, even if they didn't need ventilated for polio at the time of it, as they now know that as they got older, they developed a condition called post-polio syndrome and there'll be patients, there's only a few patients left now who we have on ventilation for post-polio. I've got a case coming up of scoliosis. I don't think we now in Highland have any patients left who are post-thoracoplasty who are on ventilation. Certainly my patient that I looked after in Caithness has died 
Um, so what happened was the thoracoplasty was done, you lost the top of the chest wall so that the area with the TB in it collapsed down and the TB couldn't live, the actual organism didn't live. But as these patients got older, because of the alteration in the um, shape of the chest wall, they developed the scoliosis. So in later life, they have run into problems with ventilatory failure, but I don't think there's now anybody alive. Neuromuscular diseases, you'll see these coming through and because Dr. McGregor is fixing the children, we are having a bit of a nightmare in adult medicine because they're surviving and they're coming through on ventilation. So now acid maltase deficiency, spinal muscular atrophy, even congenital spinal muscular atrophy, there's a child that's coming up to live in Highland, I can't rem it might even be in the Fort William area, who's ventilated for spinal muscular atrophy motor neuron disease and muscular dystrophy. And then, as we've said, all obstructive sleep apnea might not be due to obesity, but all obesity hypoventilation by the name is due to obesity. So that is where you're seeing the rise in people being ventilated. I just wanted to mention this because the registrar at Regmore, the new team, so we have a specialty doctor called Dr. Anne-Marie Shanks, who's just started. And she said to me, I was just down the other day in high dependency unit for somebody with their acute exacerbation of COPD who'd been ventilated and there was this terrible whistling noise. And they weren't fixing the ventilation because the patient had masked, I probably have a pointer, had masked the exhalation valve. So none of the CO2 was being exhaled from the system. So they couldn't fix, they couldn't understand why this patient wasn't getting better. And it's because the patient had taped over those holes. So just make sure that there is exhalation way with all our ventilators. If you're finding a patient who's lying there comatosed with their CO2. That's at the device that you'll see our patients on. It's, a, it's the same company. I think most Scottish ventilation services use ResMed. There's different ones used down in England, but I think most have gone to ResMed and that's called a VPAP ST9. You'll see on the side of the ventilator. It's about that size. These are all the interfaces. I don't know if I have a pointer. So the ones that you'll see on our patients will tend to be that mask. It's got a lovely soft blue gel. The pillow mask here, there's a few people who are using that type of mask just over the nose. And then there's a few nose, nasal masks and there's a few face masks. But the big thing about making ventilation work is choosing the right interface. So although, as Phyllis says, we have all this remote monitoring, the first bit of fitting the mask, we do have to see the patient. We cannot do that remotely because that is the bit that it's a bit like, as Dr. McGregor was saying about the inhaler working, if we don't fit the mask properly, we won't ventilate the patient because it'll all be going out the leaks of the mask. So the key point, if you're seeing somebody who's really struggling and you want to see if you can help them, the mask must be fitting comfortably. Phyllis was saying she has open access. You should see some of the masks that are being used out in the community. They're falling apart. They are stuck together. Patients have the telephone number for the sleep service. Do they get in touch when their hoses have holes in them? You just can't believe what we see coming back in. So please look at the masks, check the tubing doesn't have a big hole in it. You, there, you can get terrible ulceration when the mask is beginning not to work. They pull the straps tighter and tighter and tighter and then they get ulcers and then they can't wear their mask. And just to reiterate, this vent is very important. So if you're ever seeing somebody with a mask, particularly the full face mask, you'll be able to adjust it at the top here. There's two um, straps, uh, one up here and one lower down. The one up here, you can, uh, you can move it so that there's not got the risk of the ulceration on the nose. And then if you're seeing a patient who's actually got the mask on and there's leaks going everywhere, then you can actually just pull the mask off and allow it to just gently set, settle back on it and it will usually self seal. And you want the distance on both sides to be the same with the strap. So you don't want, you know, it's sitting. We have some very amusing pictures of how patients put their masks on. 
So if you're there and you're trying to think, I wonder if this patient with their motor neuron disease or with their scoliosis, are they developing ventilatory failure? There's a few things they'll start presenting with. So they'll say they're short of breath when they're awake. So it'll be harder for them to, their exercise tolerance will be dropping. They won't be getting up the stairs anymore. When they lie flat at night, so orthopnea, we traditionally think of cardiac failure. It's not all cardiac failure. Our patients, as they're not able to use their diaphragms, will start getting orthopnea. They start saying that they're getting the daytime sleepiness. So it could be obstructive sleep apnea. It could be the ventilatory failure. And by the time the carbon dioxide is on the way up, so carbon dioxide makes you really sleepy. So if you have put the patient in the ambulance and the ambulance crew have not known they have COPD and give them 100% oxygen, by the time they arrive at the Belford and at Ragmore, the patient is now comatose because their CO2 is 10. The normal level of your CO2 should be four to six kilopascals. So what happens if you're developing the rise in carbon dioxide is you wake with a morning headache, the headache goes away during the day, you'll start seeing peripheral cyanosis. They'll start developing ankle edema because they'll have core pulmonale and they'll be confused and that's the high CO2. So high carbon dioxide first makes you confused, then makes you comatose. So just, you probably do not know the values for blood gases. But obviously we can take them traditionally when we all trained, we took them from the wrist. We still take the majority from the wrist, which is not a pleasant place. And a lot of patients will tell you they're never going back into hospital because a doctor is not sticking a needle in their radial artery. They have my sympathy. Um, but without doing that, we do not know what's going on. So your oxygen saturation probe will only tell you oxygen. Unless you look at what's in the blood, you will not know about their CO2. So unfortunately, we do have to do it. There's other ways you can do it by earlobe capillary, but that takes time. So the acute setting, we have to do it. So the pH should be between 7.36 and 7.44. The CO2, we converted from millimetres of mercury, which are still used in the States, to kilopascals in Europe. So four to six for CO2, 10 to 14 is your normal. But in anybody with ventilatory failure, we're aiming to get the oxygen above eight is our target. And then I tend to use bicarbonate more than base excess, which obviously John Stradling does. So in terms of starting ventilation, this whole conference, because partly we're in Fort William and we're trying to say we are trying to adapt to rurality in NHS Highland, we'll try and do as much of it out as an outpatient and not as an inpatient. The times that we will have to put people on ventilation, obviously, is if they've got acute respiratory acidosis. If they've developed chronic respiratory failure, their kidneys will have compensated for the high CO2. So their bicarb will be up usually in the 30s. So you can actually see that on, the, on your serum bloods, but you have to ask for bicarbonate. It's not just um, available. Or for most sets of use and ease, you actually have to ask for the bicarb. It comes through as standard on an acute blood. So if you start seeing on, just, just you'll suddenly become aware of things that you weren't aware of, but a high bicarb, just start thinking, why is that bicarb high in the blood? It'll almost always be in somebody who's got COPD or some lung problem, but their pH will be okay because the kidneys have compensated and the carbon dioxide will be high. So that's compensated respiratory acidosis. So I threw in a few cases because I was trying to get audience participation. I don't know how the x-rays are coming from the back of the room. But this is a young gentleman in his 40s who presented in April 2016, it must have been. His symptoms were that he presented to the hospital with a cough productive appearance, sputum, early morning headaches, and was breathless on exertion. So the x-ray, I need audience participation. So you're going to have to speak. Even if it's wrong, I don't care. Somebody give me something that's really obvious on that x-ray. Can you see it? It's not that they have done the worst film ever in Resus. So it's a completely rotated film. He's got a spinal rod already in. And in fact, he's completely scoliotic. So I can't even do the impression but the lung his heart has moved over to the right hand side 
his diaphragm is paralyzed on the left and that's the gastric bubble. And actually the reason he's acutely in is the pneumonia at the right heart border. So this young lad has traveled the world with his parents who are his main carers. Young lad, cause he's my age, he's in his forties. <laughs> Just, you totally move, you're young as you get older. Um, so yeah, he, they didn't spot that he was becoming more and more unwell and that was his first presentation. And I was sitting beside, I didn't catch the lady's name, one of your local GPs and she said that a lot of the presentations to hospital now are the first presentation is their terminal presentation because you guys are doing such a good job out in the community. This was exactly the same for this young lad. It hadn't been picked up. His parents were in their 80s and they were looking after their child who was now 40, who'd obviously been severely disabled all his life. So his observations, respiratory rate was 30. He, ha he was pyrexial way up at 39. I went specially into Reg more to give you the actual values of the ABGs and they've not saved. So from my memory, his pH was 7.29, I think it was. The O2 was 5.2, so he's hypoxic. So he should be running at least at eight or above. And his carbon dioxide was 10 and his bicarbonate was 37. Because he was acidotic, that bicarbonate would normally be sitting higher than that. So pro, I think I've got the one when he gets well. So he was commenced on non-invasive ventilation because he had acute respiratory failure. I put in a few slides and then I took them back out because I thought, I don't know if you really want to know about this. So when you see the letters coming from the non-invasive ventilation clinic, they'll say the device that we're using and then they'll have IPAP. The IPAP is the inspiratory pressure. So that's the pressure that's going to be pushing the air in during inspiration. And then your EPAP is your expiratory pressure, which is going to stop the airways collapsing down at the end of expiration. So he has got, for me, a relatively high IPAP. So most of the machines will run, most people will probably be on about 16. Some people will be on 20. When you start getting into obesity hypoventilation, you'll start seeing people on IPAPs of 25. Then we have to go to a new ventilator if they're higher than that to deliver higher pressures. So he was, he did require quite a lot of inspiratory pressure. And I think that's because the scoliosis was so bad and then he's not got a diaphragm working on the left-hand side. But look what happened to his blood gases. His pH was normalized, his oxygen was up to nine, his carbon dioxide was going down and his bicarbonate settled out at 37.9. Unfortunately, this lad had, I think in total, three subsequent admissions to Ragmore and he did die, but he died from cardiac failure. So his quality of life, his mum and dad said, definitely were improved with the ventilation and he did present late. He'd had a great, you know, they had taken him Japan, Hong Kong, he'd been everywhere. So I think they looked back on their son having had a good life and that the last part of his life with us with ventilation had brought him quality of life, which is what we want to know we've actually achieved. So this case is more our typical case um, that you'll also see. So patient short of breath, productive cough, lethargy, They've got COPD in the background, so they've come into hospital with their suspected exacerbation. And just like I was saying, lo and behold, this is their first hospital admission. So we don't really have any figures. We don't know how bad their COPD is, but I think you can see from the X-ray that they're hyperinflated. The traditional teaching that you have to have, if you've got greater than six anterior ribs visible, and they're also the ribs are flattened. So that's an X-ray of somebody with COPD. And when they came into hospital, fortunately the ambulance crew were getting some messages through, hadn't given high flow oxygen. So on 28% oxygen, their pH was 7.36, oxygen low again at 6.7, CO2 9.9 .9, and bicarbonate up at 41.8. So she was quite unwell. Again, she required quite a lot of, it's very interesting when you suddenly go back to do a presentation, you think, oh, so she required quite a high pressure and she's still on that pressure. Um, 
with COPD, they quite often are on the long-term oxygen therapy because we cannot get their oxygenation good enough with just ventilation. And also it gives them the added advantage of we know the survival benefit with long-term oxygen therapy. So that's what you're going to hear from Michelle. She's going to speak about long-term oxygen therapy. So this lady is on both. And at night, you can feed the oxygen into the system into the piping for your non-invasive ventilation. So she's on it for 15 hours a day. And I saw her in clinic, she presented in 2014. So we're now three years out and she hasn't had a single admission to hospital. So that could have been previously, her first admission could have been her last. She may not have got out of hospital and she's still alive with a good quality of life and normalized blood glasses. So she's very grateful for non-invasive ventilation. She was started on non-invasive ventilation because actually in hospital we couldn't get her off it. So I don't know if you're aware of work that's going on in 7A, but we're trying to reduce the hospital admission for patients with straightforward COPD to five days. And you can do that for people that have just an exacerbation of COPD. But as soon as you need to have non-invasive ventilation, suddenly our length of stay is way out. So she was out at 28 days before she got home because we just couldn't get her off ventilation, but she's not been in again. So this is the hot news from respiratory. There's not very much hot news from respiratory. Doesn't involve steroids even from respiratory. So Patrick Murphy is a chap who's down in the Lane Fox. He's a consultant in the Lane Fox unit, which is where I saw my iron lung and everything. And Professor Mike Polke was part of this trial. So it was a multi-centre UK trial looking at whether we should be ventilating patients with COPD. Because we had a good feel that there were certain patients that definitely benefited. But of course, we need evidence-based medicine. So this just came out in the Journal of the Association of then, sorry, the American Medical Association, JAMA, um, this year in June. And they showed that patients with severe COPD, so your guys down with their FEV1 less than 50, so when they come in, they obviously have hypercapnia at the time of their exacerbation, but that doesn't always persist. So they worked out, it's a very clever design, that they would check these patients two to four weeks after their acute exacerbation. And if their PaCO2 was still elevated, it's in millimetres of mercury because we're in America, but that converts back to 6.9 kilopascals for the CO2. They're trying to work out whether the addition helped and they showed that they benefited from home mechanical ventilation in addition to the long-term oxygen therapy. And the protocol has the IPAP set at 24 and the EPAP set at eight. So it was quite high. So we're now moving our patients up to a lot higher IPAP pressures because of this paper. And they showed that the, it prolonged the time to readmission or death from 1.4 to 4.3 months. So that was a very significant improvement in their lifespan. Although we've got lots of patients out there that you think should have died on their admission and they go out. That's why your palliative care in COPD is so hard. You cannot predict how these patients will do. Some will do really well and some will survive for years when you think they're so unwell, how have they managed that? And this was a case of a gentleman I saw in clinic. So just trying to bring in the more elective setting. And also this came in from, referred in from GP through Sky Gateway. So the referral said this patient has known COPD, probably was in there that it was severe because I didn't look up the actual refer referral, but I'm sure, oh yes, it did say FEV1.56, 20% predicted, at which point I was thinking, again, he should not be alive. 0.56, you've got no, so your normal capacity is six litres and he's down at 0.56. Exercise tolerance was 30 metres. His saturations were actually not too bad at 88%. He at that time was a current smoker. So already I'm thinking, oh no, I can't give him long-term oxygen therapy because he's smoking. And he had a three month history of ankle edema. So quite rightly with the ankle edema and the fact that the FEV1 was so bad, but his oxygen were, saturations weren't so low, the GP thought, mm, could this be cardiac failure? So got the echo. Fortunately, the echo only just came in as I was about to see the patient. Right ventricle severely enlarged and severely impaired. 
The way you look for pulmonary hypertension is it's the tricuspid regurgitation gives a estimate. So if you're ever seeing us talking about pulmonary hypertension, we'll be looking for the tricuspid regurgitation on the echo. The LV was fine. The cardiologists were greatly happy. Not our problem. Um, but the left ventricle septum was actually being pushed by the right ventricle across. And that's what you see in acute pulmonary thromboembolism. So there was this sudden call, this man could have a PE. So you got a CT pulmonary angiogram. There was no clot. But what was there? I don't know if that's projecting. There's no lung. <laughs> it's just black holes. That's the top part. That's severe emphysema. It's not projecting very well. That is a very holy lung, as I would call it. And there's not much lung tissue doing any ventilation there. So when he came to clinic, his pH was very borderline for him coming into hospital. His oxygen was only 5.2, his carbon dioxide was 9, and his bicarb was 37. But we managed to commence his non-invasive ventilation as an outpatient, which was a huge success. So we started off very low and we, just, we didn't have remote monitor, monitoring ventilator at that time. And we just gradually took up his pressures. And over a period of two to three months, he settled out and his blood gases when I saw him in the clinic in February this year were very good. And he stopped smoking. Not that that is going to make a huge difference, but he did stop smoking. So at least if we need to, we'll be able to give him oxygen in there. And he's very, very grateful, enjoying his life. The other thing that comes into this is that when we see these patients, of course, all the respiratory nurse specialists are doing a load of work in the background. It's not just the sleep team they're taking on, trying to get the patient pulmonary rehabilitation, sorting out that they're on optimal inhalers. So it's a whole team. There is no one individual that's doing all of this. It's massive work in the background. This is a chap we now, I don't, when we all started, well certainly when I'm speaking about doxapram, when I started, I graduated in 95. The life expectancy of a patient with, with muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, was late teens. This chap died when he was, I was trying to work out the age, so he was 27. As you can see, he actually was tracheostomy ventilated. So the last two lads who've unfortunately died in the last two years with Duchenne's have been tracheostomy ventilated, but I don't think we'll see that again because our masks and our ways of putting people onto ventilation have changed. Both these lads were put on because they presented to intensive care acutely. So now we know and you'll be aware of, of your Duchenne population that we need to get in early and get them on non-invasive ventilation. So hopefully no more young lads will present straight to ITU and then need tracheostomy ventilation. But Alexander, we were all very fond of in Ward 11 and then subsequently Ward 7A where we moved to. And it was very sad, but he actually died of gut problems because we were seeing problems that have never really been seen in Duchenne. We've now got new problems that they're dying of because they're living that much longer. And then motor neuron disease, obviously Gordon Aikman, who did a huge amount for the population with motor neuron disease in Scotland. He died in February this year and he has ensured that every health board has a motor neuron disease nurse. The only place they haven't recruited is to the Western Isles and that's partly, I think, their population size. But we help and so do Glasgow with um, patients with motor neuron disease in the Western Isles. And then really sad, Doddy Weir was diagnosed in June this year with motor neuron disease. So it's been known since 2006 that non-invasive ventilation when patients with motor neuron disease develop respiratory failure, that it will give them an extra three to six months of life. Obviously they, towards the end of life, become totally ventilator dependent. And now we have, a, we have had to develop a protocol as to how in the last days of life do we stop the ventilator. So there's a huge amount of work going right in right at the end to make sure that there'll be support. So the motor neuron disease nurse will be with the family if the family choose to be at home and there'll be support from the respiratory team. And most patients can't thank us enough again. Most patients with motor neuron disease will go for ventilation. And most patients will also have a PEG tube fitted. There's a bit of a message in that because you cannot fit the PEG tube 
when you're lying flat and on a ventilator. So the PEG tube needs to go in ahead of time. But I, I don't think any of these decisions, because we have Andy Bethnal, who's um, the motor neuron disease nurse for the whole of NHS Highland, he is great. And I think if you ever need any support with any patients, contact Andy, because he's a very good um, source of help to both people looking after patients and to the patients and families themselves.